is the Doing Diversity in Writing podcast, the show where we as authors explore the better practices of writing inclusively, whether that be in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, class, sexuality, ability, and so on. Why are we here? To bring more depth and breadth to the characters in our fiction and represent them in the best way possible. My name is Bethany A. Tucker, and with me each week is my co-host, Marielle S. Smith. Ready? Let's dive in. Hey, Marielle. It's another episode, episode two, season two. Yes. Hey, Bethany. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. It got cold here. It actually snowed 20 minutes away from us. And um, that's not exactly what people told me would happen when I moved to Macon, Georgia. So I'm just not going to believe people about weather anymore. I'm done. I'm over. Every time I go places, they say, this like happens once in a blue moon. And then it happens to me. That kind of sounds like manifesting in a really weird way. <laughs> or the century we live in. I don't know. Or that. Yeah, we, we've had snow for weeks up on the mountains. I haven't seen it, but yeah, it's been. It, it didn't actually snow on my house, but I did wake up one morning in the last few days and the yard was sparkly and encrusted with frozen oh, yeah. dew which means I bought a house at the top of a hill and I will have to buy salt or something if I want to move my car down that during the dark parts of the day. So very pleased, grateful, happy that it melted before anyone needed to move their car. Some sun does the trick, I'd say. Yes. Or driving thrashing rain a few degrees above freezing. Yeah, that usually, that helps a lot. Yeah, I love that. No, yeah, but it does help. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? You said you had some things on your mind today. Yes, I am editing this article about cancel culture. This researcher talks about uh, American Dirt by Janine Cummins. There was quite a controversy around that one. Yes, um, quite a lot. This researcher quotes this passage from Literary Hub where they are responding to Oprah, asking Oprah, because Oprah picked uh, American Dirt as uh, the book she picked for her book club. Yeah, so they sent this um, asking her to reconsider. So this is part of that, and it was published by Literary Hub. What's the So quote? what is this? Many of us are also fiction writers, and we believe in the right to write outside of our own experiences. Writing fiction is essentially impossible to do without imagining people who are not ourselves. However, when writing about experiences that are not our own, especially when writing about the experiences of marginalized people, still more especially when these lived experiences are heavily politicized, oppressed, threatened, and disbelieved, when this is the case, the writer's duty to imagine well, responsibly, and with complexity becomes even more critical. End of quote. That is a very season one of our podcast kind of quote. I just wanted to share this because I love that I am working on something like this while we are doing this podcast and then articles like this come my way and that just makes me really happy. I am glad that you're enjoying this one. I just want to remind everyone listening that if you are jumping on and you just jumped on and listened to this episode, go ahead, have fun, enjoy it. We, We want you to, but we really set up a lot of basics, a lot of language, a lot of concepts in the first 12 episodes, especially the first 11 that would be really useful to go back and start from the beginning and just listen all the way through after season one if you want to just pick and choose topics go ahead it will be better if you listen all the way through to all of them but if you go back and listen to just season one in order that'll give you like the primer on the topic of doing diversity in writing yeah because that's where we really laid the foundation yeah of what are we talking about? Why are we talking about this? Why do we need to talk about this? What are the most important topics around this? Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's why as I was going, as I was editing this, this particular article, I was just so struck by this particular quote. I was like, it so sums up the message that we've been spreading throughout that first season. Yeah, but you're right. Like if people are just jumping in, we do have a whole season in which we kind of like go back to basics. Yes, we, we start at the yeah. basics. All right. Yeah. But we are in season two. This is episode two, season two. And yes. I'm going to introduce our topic. Yes. Uh, and I'm probably going to like dump a bunch of stuff on Marielle today that she doesn't know about, mostly like literature and TV. And we're going to have fun talking about it. So today we are tackling a question, a concept that I've seen show up in a lot of boards and online forums for writers, much like we tackled in season, uh, not season one, uh, episode one of this season. So we're kind of going through these questions that a lot of people ask. Yeah. And the question is, how do I write race or how do we write race in worlds and situations where the history of our real world doesn't apply or doesn't exist or it's so far in the future that you know maybe they don't even remember that America was a country or it's like a mythology at this point and a lot of people struggle with this and it's easy to find ways it's been done wrong it's interesting (laughs) to examine why it could be done this is going to be one episode where we actually do talk about shows that shows and books that we even love a lot but then dissect how we might do it differently or how we can do it better especially as the reading demographic has changed or the watching demographic in English has changed over the decades so here we go we're answering these commonly asked questions again yes so You want to talk about something about, I I don't even know if it's a show or or a series of novels. I've never heard of them, so bring it on. Okay, so back in college, shout out to one of my friends that would drag me out by my ear and make me go to his dormitory and watch sci-fi shows on the sci-fi channel. Uh, He introduced me to a show called Babylon 5. I think there's five seasons. It was just recently remastered and it's on HBO Max. I don't keep all the streaming services little names straight. HBO Max is what I think it's on. So it just came out remastered again. I was able to watch a little bit of it as I prepped. So it's a show set in space, way far in the future. Humans come from Earth. There are other species which... I'm not going to get their names correct. So there are other species. There are four main species that show up oftentimes, but the space, the orbital platform or the the space station, which is huge, it has its own farms and everything inside of it, that the show is based around is called Babylon 5. And it's this, it's run by humans from Earth So most of the characters in the center of the show are human, but then there's also a council that's supposed to like mediate and be, they're all ambassadors and they're all from the different races. The, there's a lot more races than five. In fact, I'm never sure exactly how many races because every now and then you see a new race walk in as an extra or a visitor because it's like most TV shows, you know, some characters show up for an episode and some characters are there over and over again. But it's kind of like a neutral territory that's not particularly neutral because when the humans get mad, they really like, nah, this is ours. But they mm-hmm. they meet and it's kind of like this, I want to call it Switzerland. It's not Switzerland. It's just this little bit of the wild west where people meet and they negotiate and they try to stop wars from happening and there's a lot of trade and it's very much like the seaport in almost neutral territory in space and all kinds of hijinks happen i had never seen a tv show in my life before this one like from start to finish 
So it was an entirely new experience for me. Uh, my friend is still insufferably proud of himself for getting me to watch TV, but that's, that's a whole thing that's not part of this show. <laughs> so when I was thinking about like diversity and trying to think, well, where have I seen diversity happen? And when it didn't relate directly to the history of the modern world that we live in that you can Mm -hmm. open up your textbooks and read because this is set so far and it's like 3000 or something so I I thought about this show and I went back and I watched the first episode again because in my head I'm like okay there's Garibaldi he's the head of security and then there's the commander they're both white guys (laughs) definitely like they definitely like white guys and then there's uh the the love interest for the commander oh she's she's a white woman and then I was like I'm trying to remember I feel like there's more diversity so I watched it again and it was very bro heavy (laughs) like white bro heavy and I'm like oh like I enjoy the show and I believe it was filmed in the 90s so it's it's dated and I think it's just interesting to watch who they chose to do what because the second in command of the space station doesn't have quite as big a role to play but she is a woman with a very definite Japanese descent like she has a very American sounding first name but her last name is Japanese and she looks full-blooded Japanese to me and she has a little bit of Japanese heritage showing up in her life like in her private quarters and she has a a black tech who answers to her and there's like one other black tech but the whole security team answers to a white guy and they're all white guys So there's like a little bit of diversity, but if you look at who the show is aimed at and who like is making a lot of the decisions, it's like white guy commander, there's the Japanese second in command, but you sometimes forget she's second in command. You have the head of security is a white guy. And then there's, it's just, and then the commander answers to another white guy on earth. (laughs) So if you're watching who has power, and that was an interesting thing for me as I was thinking about this is, yes, you can have people on screen or on the pages of your book who are diverse, but where are you putting them? And what messages Uh does it send? And for me, watching the first episode of this frankly dated show that I absolutely love and plan to rewatch the whole thing of, is this like, it's white guy in power, white guy in power, white guy in power. And then we start getting some other people. Yeah, but that's like when we we talked about the first season, like the two steps of of representation, right? So they are there. Mm -hmm. What kind of roles are they allowed to play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes, they are there. Not even a lot, right? It's just very minor, but they are there. It's just that the the important roles so the main roles but also the decision making roles they're usually played by white guys yeah i am just so i can this is just as you were talking about this i was just thinking and i, I have to double check if i'm correct in remembering this but there is this dutch sci-fi series and it was like really it's a very it's very typical dutch it's very the humor is very dutch I loved it. I think there was only two seasons. I cannot even remember the name right now because I literally just thought about it. But I am, so this is set in the future as well. And it's about, um, you know, people who who know a little bit of the Netherlands. It's like the Dutch are very famous for fighting against the water, right? The sea. Yes, very. Um, So this is about basically the whole world is gone. Everything is sea. Just a little bit of the Netherlands is still you know <laughs> inhabitable because we're awesome when it comes to um you know working with water but we have, of course have sent so we're the only ones that are still alive <laughs> and um we've sent uh, some people on a spaceship to look for another planet because this is you know it's not a sustainable situation right like it's um 
And I'm just, I'm thinking now that all of these people on this spaceship, so this is in the future, I think they're all white. Mm. Which is not a... proper it's not logical it's not logical it's it's just looking at the dutch population now that's not logical yes but this is said so much further in the future so it just does not make sense so here's the thing and i'm i'm gonna get a little you know brass tacks about this in the u.s and the uk and I, I talked about this a little bit in season one. Were people who look white are on track to be the majority minority, and in California already are, partially because of population shifts, but also because of, frankly, interracial marriages, such as what I'm in people are being born as more and more people come in contact with each other and they're not, their parents come from different, um, you know, ethnic cultural makeups and they look like that. And white people genetically don't fare very well uh, when you mix them with some, mix the DNA with someone else, people don't come out looking white most of the time. (laughs) Not, Not the way that we look white. With no. our Irish and Scottish blood. No. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's a very, very small part, like you might look white. If you're like 1% African and the rest of you is European or, you know, Western European, you might look very white. But if it's like half and half, um, it's going to yeah. show. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about these worlds, things set in the far future, and everybody is looking white almost, I'm like, okay, I'm not buying it. Scientifically, this is not, we're already seeing that this is not the future of the human race. Yeah. And so what you're talking about is, so you're talking about California, right? That's that's your example. Um, But I, I remember us talking about that the same goes for the UK. Yes. So when we talk about this shift, what we're talking about is countries that are now mostly populated by white people. They're going to have to shift. But if you look, of course, at the at the world as a whole, like white people might be the majority, but that's a political majority. They're not actually they've never been the majority. They've never in human history. White people have never been the majority. And when I in terms of numbers. Yeah. Yes, in terms of yeah. numbers. So when I see these human conglomerations and most of the people running the ships or being crew members are white, it's not, it's not if you're trying to write like a hard science show, it's not a representation <laughs> of who's going to actually be in those shows. No, but then of course, like these shows are made for the people who are watching now. And I, I, yeah. I think we should really, really talk about audience at some point. Yes. Yeah, but I do agree with you that it's, it's, if people start complaining about like people on a on on science fiction shows being too diverse, I don't think that argument holds at all. Like, I don't know if there's an example like that with where the the characters are really that diverse no Um, I don't think I've seen a show where you could point to it and say oh it's it's too diverse well I I don't necessarily think we would ever say it's too diverse Um, yeah so there is an example this is an interesting thing I I don't have any notes on it but if anyone has seen Gundam Wing there's colonies in that. And the colonies were colonized by specific cultural people groups. And so in these colonies, like one of them was colonized by China. So everyone on it was Chinese. And that makes sense. It was a colony that was built and created by one political cultural entity on earth. And then everyone in it is Chinese. It 
was a distinct creation to make more people in space that were Chinese. And there was like one colony that was done by France, another colony that was built by the US, and I think one colony was built by Japan. I haven't seen all of Gundam Wing. I've just read a lot of fan fiction and read a lot about it. So everyone coming from these colonies in the future, in this space war that they're having, which is still in our, our solar system, I believe, look, sound, act, speak the languages of those people groups far in the future. But there's a history in the universe that the story is being told in to explain why they are still, you yeah. know, monocultural. Yeah. Yeah, so that for me would work. Yes. Because somebody has explained to me why in the story, right? So that is not like a plot hole. Or it's not a, a, plot, not a hole. plot hole, it's a world building hole. Yes, I like that, a world building hole. I actually was thinking it's a world, probably than a world building crater. Or a or universe something. building hole, because we're setting this in yeah. space. Yes, it's a black hole. <laughs> but when I look at Star Trek, which granted, I've seen only a couple seasons. and. I always get confused when people talk about this Star Trek versus that Star Trek. But when I just look at the cast of Star Trek and it's supposed to be like this federation, I kind of start wondering why everyone, why so many people look the same. And now Star Trek is an interesting example. I dug up a little bit of information of it that they were one of the first shows to have a black woman not be someone in a service capacity, like a serving capacity as a reoccurring character on the show. And this was a big, big deal. She was part of the crew. She had responsibility. Um, I think she was a lower level officer on the control deck of one of the ships. And the story goes that she was considering leaving because there was so much pressure and that Martin Luther King, and we are recording on the observation of Martin Luther King Day here in the US, uh, that Martin Luther King told her that he was her biggest fan and really, really asked her to stay because it was such a big deal that she was doing this, that she was showing up and everyone was seeing her in this role that hadn't been seen before. So it's, our shows are definitely, our shows, our, our books, our movies are definitely a representation of what's going on today. It's not just this scientifically perfect representation of the future. Yeah. But it's, as much as I want to criticize Star Trek for not like matching my idea of what would naturally happen with the evolution of the human race that far in the future, they did do things that people had never seen done before. Yeah. So in their, in their way for their time. Yes. So uh, the woman's name was, I don't actually know how to pronounce it. I think it's Nicole Nichols, N-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, um, Nichols. And she portrayed the character Uhura. Uh, and she was the first African-American woman seen in television as a, one of the first African-American women seen in television as a primary character that was not a servant or a maid. And we will link to the article. Yeah. There's so actually like several articles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this is the thing, right? It's like, and, and this is something that I've learned through like my studies that, um, I always prefer an affirmative reading of the past. Like it's very, really easy when you look at products that were made in the past mm -hmm. to sort of like, like point and say, well, you didn't do this correctly or you didn't like, look like, it's very easy to do that from where you are today. Yes. Right. It's like, so I have this, I, I, I have half a PhD and it's half a PhD because I quit and, you know, I, I went full-time editing and writing. Um, 
a so lot of my come pe- do this podcast with me, right? Yes, yes. So what <laughs> I gave up, what I gave up to work with Bethany is um, I was doing a lot of research of Freudian psychoanalysis. And people always kind of laugh about that because we kind of laugh a little bit about Freud now. Mm. But the thing is, and, and I want to say, so I want to just simply compare this. Uh, so, so when I say affirmative reading, this is really sort of a feminist gesture that I've learned, like a feminist way of reading the past, is that you can be both critical while saying or understanding, okay, but I understand that within that particular context, this made all the sense. Yes. So so for, for me in my studies, that was, you know, Freud said certain things that we now consider hilarious but like a lot of those things he wrote around 1900 um so yes so we should not take that doesn't mean we need to dismiss his entire oeuvre or what he was saying it just means that no we have to take that and put it in today's context and then see how it still applies or how it could apply differently and so if we think about star trek but right. when they did that, they were the first to do that. Would it have been amazing if if they had diversity across the board? Yes, of course. They actually had yeah. more diversity. They had George Dakai, it's Japanese, and later came out as gay as well. And they had, uh, and remember, this was recorded during the Cold War. They had a very obvious Russian person also in the cast. So for their time, they really did push it. And that's that's become part of it. And they're still pushing it today. I have not caught up on all the movies, but I know that they have more and more more diversity in the movies and shows that have come out in the last 10 years or less, which I'm excited to see. I just have not caught up because I'm not caught up on even the shows that I am very, very much a fan of because I'm running behind on... I'm I'm behind on Marvel right now. I haven't seen the Eternals yet. So I haven't seen anything of Marvel since half the earth was poof. Because that's when I move it's and don't say anything. Because I have (laughs) not heard any spoilers. No, I haven't seen a film. Oh my Um, gosh. It's moving to Cyprus, and I cannot figure out a VPN to log in to Disney Plus. We we need to fix this somehow because I'm going to want to talk about some of these things on the show. Marvel is definitely pushing some of the lines of representation. Yes. So if you can figure out a VPN. That allows me, because the ones I've been trying thus far have failed me, because uh, I have access to Disney Plus. I just, I just can't get on it because it doesn't right. exist in Cyprus. Well, if any of our listeners listening have a solution so that we can get Marielle to watch some of the latest shows so we can talk about them for you, please write us at yes save me yeah what's save our email address <laughs> diversity in writing at gmail.com yes right yes. at diversity in writing at gmail.com yeah give me a good vpn yes all right so i'm gonna go back to babylon 5 for a minute and remember i love this show but i re-watched a little bit of it in the eyes of a developmental editor today Mm-hmm. And what I would advise people to be up to date for today and the best practices. One of the things that struck me is writing diversity doesn't stop with the human characters in your show. Because every concept, every alien, every culture comes from somewhere. We take a little bit of what we know and we roll it up and we add some. Pl- Plato, and in some people's cases, you know, take a glass of wine or smoke some weed and try to stick some weird stuff in there to make it our own. 
I mean, I just, you know, go for a walk and drink some coffee, but I, I know some people do more than that. And then you end up with this new thing, uh, new alien, new culture, new planet, whatever. Yeah. So what we put into our brains affects what comes out of our brains. And you watch these shows and you could see what's going in is also what's coming out. So one of the alien species in Babylon 5 are very obviously somewhat based on a conglomeration of Asian cultures. They're very reserved. They're, they have a little bit of like a Tang dynasty slash, you know, imperial Japan, Meiji era kind of dress code. And they're, they're very quiet. They hold their hands in front of them. They're also very light skinned and considered mm-hmm. to be kind of a bit more spiritual than other species. And the second love interest that the commander has is a female of this species. So there's another species that was considered warlike at one point in time. They look kind of like colonial era Europe more of like the big hairstyles, the wigs, the very ornate embroidery kind of uh, Mm -hmm. uh, men's suits kind of thing before they became more streamlined in the industrial era. Back back like 16, 1700s, um, like the shoe buckles and stuff like that. It made me definitely- Yeah, yeah, so so think like Marie Antoinette. Yes, thank you. I was trying to reach for the right term. So- They are also, ex- I mean, they look white. They look French-ish. Um, Literally and, Marie Antoinette. Yes, sort of. Yeah. And they kept slaves. So they mm-hmm. enslaved one of the other alien populations previously. And this is all in the first episode. It's not going to spoil anything if you want to go see Babylon 5. The people that they enslaved are a more reptilian, darker skinned race, almost brown, brown green skin. Interesting. And they have a little bit more of an aggressive appearance. They're very large, they're very physically strong. They can become unable to speak when they're very emotional, like lose their language and just like growl and like storm out of the room. Okay, so some animalistic, animalistic. besides the besides the features, like you said, they're like lizard-like. Yes. Right. Like so, aside the features, also their behavior. Yes. Yes, yes. and their brain capacity. They have the capacity to be extremely well versed in knowledge and they have space travel they negotiate i mean they're very sentient but this is what i was going back to before what you put in in your brain as a creator as a writer comes out and what came out in this show is a fallen previous colonial power white-skinned alien race that previously lorded over this more animalistic, darker skinned, less human looking race. Yeah. So when I said brain capacity, I didn't mean what I meant was like, you know, if you have this idea that, you know, uh, um, the white race, right, are more rational. Mm. And that doesn't mean that the black race cannot also be rational. But there's this sort of like this colonial idea that it's uh, that um, one is ruled from the black passions. Yes, yeah, so it's more about the emotions, right? So they can be extremely um, like we have, like like uh, I'm thinking like uh, um, Du Bois, for example, right? We have these 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 black, very eloquent black scholars, right? Which kind of for me it proves, right, that. The whole everything, like for me, it's so obvious that I think for a long time, scholars like these were like taken as sort of the exception to the rule, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah, they can be more like us, 
right? These few exceptions, but generally, you know, when like emotions rise, they just com completely get overwhelmed uh, by this sort of animalistic, more passion, like, so that when you were saying that, it was like, that's for me, that would be very painful to watch. Yeah. And I don't think we need to like bring up examples of what happens at like rugby games or football games when one side loses or another and uh, everyone goes crazy and they're mostly white. So, <laughs> yes. But yes. the point is, as we construct these ideas of cultures and races and aliens and places where our human history right now does not necessarily apply, Creators can find themselves repeating it anyway. Yeah. And this happens over and over again. I'm picking on Babylon 5 as like one example to keep us centered today, but I could bring up a lot more examples yeah, yeah, yeah. where this mm -hmm. still happens. Yeah. And this is actually, it brings me, I need to look at my notes um because I was, I was, um, remember last episode, we talked about the Salt and Sage book. Uh, yes. how to write black characters and I was just going through their stereotypes and their tropes and they actually um one of the tropes they talk about is the savage or uh, it's not a trope it's a stereotype one of the, the stereotypes they talk about is the savage stereotype right um so they so it's it's this sort of this 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 um also speaks to the sort of animalistic nature closer to their emotions, stuff like that. And they actually say uh, in the book, like, so the, the, the stereotype is also used to show that these, these people need white people to be civilized, right? Be because, it's one of those yeah. tropes that definitely does show up in literature, especially historically. Yeah, so so they say like this trope comes up a lot in traditional fantasy fiction, um, and it says that so it can also contribute to white savior narratives, right? So this is for me it was just it was so when I was reading that this is like the the, the they're so explicit here that they talk about fantasy fiction. Right. And then they call it traditional, quote unquote, traditional fantasy fiction. I'm like, yes, because we do see that a lot. So even if it's like a fantasy world, we do see this sort of like repeated. Yeah. Um, and because it's quite recent, I do feel like we have to address the Game of Thrones size yes! in the room. Yes. I want to talk about <laughs> that so bad. Yes. Because here we have, we have the trope. We have the white savior, Daenerys. Yeah, and, and who is extremely pale, almost yes. white hair, um, quite beautiful, and a very, a very uh, compelling character. Like you're not, you're not kind of cool one way or the other if you're watching it. Like I don't even watch the shows all the time, but I have looked up her storyline because even in clips, like. Daenerys is a very compelling character. Okay, I have never seen a single episode of Game of Thrones. Um, so I researched this. This okay. particular thing we're going to talk about, I researched this because back in the day when I was still a university teacher, one of my students wrote a paper on this. And I did read some Game of Thrones but I stopped reading halfway through the second novel because some of my favorite point of view characters had died. Um, others were introduced that I really couldn't care less about. And then others, uh, some of my favorites were so minimal in the second book that at one point I just gave up. Um, so I know I, my introduction to Daenerys is I think I know her like her husband is dead and I think she I, I think I, I, I read through her finding the the eggs okay. right and deciding everything burns and then she decides to uh, so so I did so the, the first scene I've ever watched the only scene I've ever seen is is where she frees the unsullied and I, I because I had to watch it for this episode 
the look on your face is so much right now I'm telling the audience because I can't see you I'm just I'm just yeah so uh, let me set it up for the people who don't know Game of Thrones and I don't which is allowed which is allowed it is allowed yes I'm not worried about spoiling it because at this point it's become such a big issue that you are living under a rock if you don't have this spoiled already for you and also we're going to talk about a grain of salt, salt in the hole. Like we're not telling anything about the story, right? Not, not a lot. No, not a lot. No. So there is this the scene that we're particularly thinking about today. And, be, and we're bringing this up because of the white savior trope that shows up in traditional fantasy and even science fiction so much. Is the scene where... Denarius uh, buys all of the Unsullied and she then frees them. And the scene is, it, it has this iconic, like really uh, strong visual imagery where all of these people of various shades of uh, brown, mostly, um, some of it's closer to black skin, but most of it's brown skin, um, are lifting her up. And she's, she's dressed in like blue and she's this very white creature in the sea of brown and beige. And they're lifting her up and she's almost body surfing in the middle. And the camera like goes down and is looking down on top of this sea of people with Denarius in the center. I did not see that scene. You didn't? No, I saw the scene where she buys them and then they leave. After mm-hmm. the after her dragon burns the guy, and then they leave, and then she asks them, like, do you want to be f- like you're free now, so you can leave, it's fine, or you can work, you can work for me as a free man, and then they all start like, they have their spears or whatever, and they start thumping on the floor, and then she knows she has her army, and then then they pick a leader. Uh, but it could be that because I just saw f- stuff on YouTube, right? So I could just mm-hmm. have seen little bits of, of, of cut bits. Anyway, the point that you're making is you have this really extremely white character in a sea. You called it a sea of brown. Brown and beige, but yes. Yes. but for, And I looked very close because this is what we're going to talk about. So I looked specifically at the skin color of those in um in armor right mm-hmm. I looked there. and yes it's very brown yeah yes and I went back and I checked it's in the books that way as well uh so sometimes people will be like well when they adapted it that's not how the books and I was like well let's check and when I checked it is the way that it's written in the books as well so it's just it is this very very strong visual imagery and then where did you find because I found something completely different you didn't uh I watched it on YouTube here's no I mean in the book in the book oh I checked the wiki I didn't reread the whole book oh okay no okay because I got I found a, a, a it's not a direct quote right Mm-hmm. But what I got is um, a text saying. So this is from uh, this is from a re- this is from this sort of world of world of Game of Thrones website thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it's a huge. So there it says that when she was looking, what she saw was that more than half of them, more than half are of of uh, Dothraki stock, which yes. is like a copper copper skin colored Mm -hmm. people so not brown people right well others appear to be from Lys and Quarth which are both really white pale peoples and even the same ethnicity as their slavers who are white while others are from people she does not recognize so that's what Mm -hmm. I got I got that it's an extreme mix and that's also what my student um, wrote about that the people were very mixed that she specifically notices how mixed they are and especially that they had the same color as their 
slave owners. So when I checked the wiki um, for the books, it was that a lot of the slaves came from the areas around the towns where they were being trained and that um, those people were of multiple ethnicities, but more of it was on the darker end. Again, well, that's it does, a it, wiki. It does say, so. yeah. Well, it does say more than half are of Dothraki stock. Okay. I just but sent there is, you yeah. an article um, in our chat and you can find the image that I keep talking about. Okay. If you okay. just open that and look at it real quick, I kind of want to see your face when you see it. Okay. This is going to so nerdy. <laughs> but, but, but this is important, right? Because the point that I want to make um, or what I want to bring across is that sometimes when I'm still looking, I'm looking for the image. Just wait you for have to a little scroll bit. down. Well, wait. no, it's just it's just really slow. Really slow to load. Yeah. Oh, is that her creepy brother? Oh yeah. Okay, I see it now. Yeah, the image. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's what I wanted to talk about Game of Thrones is because she describes it clearly as a mixture, even though like half of them are of a very particular color and in the Dothraki more like the copper skinned. Uh, that's how they are described from what I got. Um, so my student was like, but in the, in the, when it became visual, it became like the sort of homogenous mass. Yes. Yes. And that I find extremely, well, problematic, but also interesting because in the novel, there is more mix. So how come when it is turned into something visual, why are certain choices being made? Hi, everyone. It's Mariella. Are you tired of getting in your own way and not having a sustainable writing practice? Then the 52 Weeks of Writing Author Journal and Planner is for you. 52 Weeks of Writing makes you plan, track, reflect on, and improve your progress and goals an entire year long. It gets you to unravel the truth about why you aren't where you want to be, and it keeps you writing through weekly thought-provoking quotes and prompts. 52 Weeks of Writing brings together every lesson I have learned over the past few years as a writer and a writing coach. Wary as I am of comparisonitis and unhealthy competition, I designed this undated author journal and planner to help writers develop a practice that honors their own needs and desires. If you're ready to become the writer you were always meant to be, go to mswordsmith.nl slash journal and order your copy today. Yeah, I heard one person make the suggestion that because it was filmed in Morocco, it was too expensive to bring in a diverse cast of extras. I call BS on that. <laughs> yes, I call BS on that as well. Yeah, And I will say that the visuals, the contrast between her and then everyone around her makes for good television. It makes for good visual iconic images. Yeah. You remember yeah. it very clearly. But then I'm going back to, is this a good idea? Forget morals, forget ideals. Is this a good idea in a world where art is more and more globalized as it's sold and English-based media is being absorbed by more and more people of different backgrounds? Is this really how we want to tell stories going forward? Because well, as artists, we're dating ourselves. Well, especially for me, like, of course, my answer to your question is no, hell no. But especially because most of the time, and I, I do want to talk about The Witcher and Shadow and Bone, because um, most of the time, the, the original works are not necessarily explicit about diversity. 
and then when a show so the, so so when i say most of the times i mean these days that's it's becoming more common so when a show makes it onto netflix or whatever it's it's made um people make it more diverse so they try to make it more diverse because they understand that today the audience is not like i, I know you've mentioned a lot of the rings and that Lord of the Rings is extremely white. Yes, and I actually uh, have a problem with that. I have comments for that later if we want to talk about it. But an example of a show that would traditionally be extremely white but then wasn't is actually BBC Merlin. It came out a while back, like I think like 10 years or so. And Gwen I in that show that. is actually a woman of color. So Guinevere, yes. author's love interest, is a woman of color. Which is really an interesting choice. Really an interesting choice. She was yeah. really great for the role. The show was extremely popular and the acting is really well done. They just took a, a medieval time period and without talking about it, just did a more than a, a, a cast that had different people groups in it. Yeah. So this is my cue. I want to talk about The Witcher. Okay. Can we? Yes. Um, have you I'm seen gonna, it? I have seen like five episodes of it. Okay. That's more than I saw by this time last week. Because I saw the first episode and it was such a mess. And I was so confused that I was like, I'm not going to do this. And then I realized we were talking about this topic. And then I also had my booster last week. So I took a few days off and I was like, eh, may, and, and, and think these really funny memes keep showing up about The Witcher. I love I was, the music. It's, it's so I'm like, and the memes are amazing. So I was like, okay, so it looks like it's really funny. Maybe I should just watch it, right? So by now, so we are a week later, I've seen both episodes and a lot of the extra stuff that's available. You mean both seasons? So, yes. Oh, there's said episodes. episodes. No. Okay, no, both seasons. I was like, yeah. there's more than two episodes. There's two yeah, seasons. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So I watched both. Uh, just like I binged it this weekend. Um, and I was really, I was kind of really happy that there is some diversity. Like there can always be more diversity. And, and I did come across an article that said, well, The Witcher is doing great on race, but how about some LGBTQIA plus representation, right? That's something they could do better in the third season. Um so here it is the case that there was a lot of controversy, not a lot of, but the, the, what was there was really intense. And, and the, the producer or the showrunner actually like was really spoke up about it because it was such intense uh, backlash um, that people were afraid they were making it too diverse. Because okay. it is like the, 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 the writer is Polish right? Mm -hmm. So even though the world is not based on our world, it does, of course, have Eastern European history and folklore. That's what it's based on. Yes. Right. So basically, before they started writing The Witcher, apparently they put a picture of the writing room on Twitter, like, ta-da, we're so excited to start writing The Witcher. And there were so many different people of so many different races and gender that people were just freaking out. Because they were like, this should just, like, where are the European, like, where are the Eastern Europeans writing this stuff? Because, you know, and people were even saying things like, oh, so The Witcher is going to be trans and stuff like that. Like, people were really, it was not nice. Like, I've watched, I've, I've they read They sound a little stuff. triggered. Yes, that which triggered me to be honest, because um, I was really excited to see a black elf, right? And and like and and more like it's 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 really like I said like I mean there could be more diversity, but for where it is set, it is indeed quite diverse, right? So I I sort I I obviously started digging into this a little bit like okay so why if there was such a backlash like why was it and as it turned out is that apparently I'm not a video gamer so I do not know the game right I know by now that there was a game and that's why it becomes so popular worldwide I watched right? my husband play the games yeah so 
I think for a lot of people, they look at the game and they're like, that's my witch world. That's what it should look like. But of course, what they did is they went to the novels. The original source material. Yes. And apparently, this is what the showrunner says, um, the author of the series reached out to them before they started doing the actual writing and said it would be amazing if they could honor the diversity of the series in the show. Because he thought that would be an honor to his work. Mm -hmm. So he actually reached out to say, yes, this is the point. So I'm like, people are like, you're, people are really upset (laughs) that, you know, his work was like butchered and that people were just like being really politically correct and you're just putting diversity where it shouldn't be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I'm like, and then I, we learned that the author has 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 made it very explicit. We could use some more diversity. Okay, so going beyond what is desired or not desired, I think we can safely say that despite there being some very loud voices on Twitter or whatever else saying that they were concerned that they're their ideal that they'd gotten from the games wasn't going to be honored the show has done very well yes and this is the thing it's like these were a few very like most people were very excited right so this it's not as if it's like 50 percent hates it and 50 percent loves it no it's like a small percentage but the thing is these voices are so loud and so mean and so nasty um but they're not a majority. The show is doing no, well. Absolutely it is, not. It's commercially viable to yeah. have these diverse casts inside these shows. The Witcher, I believe, is renewed for third season. The books absolutely. sell yeah. very well. The books themselves have diversity within them. And uh, the fan fiction definitely covers the LGBTQ plus uh, diversity yeah, so the- range. <laughs> I haven't fan read it. Just, I've just heard people talk about it. Okay, I haven't I've read not, the fan fiction. I never really, like, I don't even know where to look for it. So I've never really read any fan fiction of anything. Um, but, but yeah, but this is, so for me, this is really interesting. And, and it's, it's, but more the discussion between, so when we look at Game of Thrones, like the way it was, the, it's the author, you know, making mm-hmm. a certain group of people that we, have come to see as you know, slaves are usually, you know, even if they're in a different race, they they end up having like a darker skin than the people who have enslaved them. So, you know, we have this, we have the author of Game of, Game of Thrones, the series, trying to mix that up. And then like when it ends up on the screen, that's sort of like his attempt is sort of like erased. And then we have The Witcher in which the author is like, I would be honored or it would be an honor to my work if you could really speak to the diversity. And then you have uh, Shadow and Bone, which is, um, I think that was just the first season that I've seen. And this is a show, I, so I've not read the books. Apparently the books are really good, but I've just, this is one of those having a bad weekend oh a new show let's watch it and then suddenly you know it was the end of the day and I'd seen the whole season in one sitting one of those shows um so this author actually starts out in a very sort of homogenous world and she actually says um that this is this was due when I quote from an article uh, from the same source that your your picture from uh, Daenerys uh, came from. She says, I was really echoing a lot of the fantasy I'd grown up with, which were very white, very straight, sort of traditional chosen one stories. So that's how she started out. But then as the novels, her, her universe sort of like progressed, she mm-hmm. started introducing different characters of different races. She also started making, giving them... Um, different racial and ethnic backgrounds like if they hadn't had if if that hadn't been made explicit in the first few books she just gave them a background right yeah so when when they started filming this 
she said, she told Netflix, please fix like my lack of diversity. So what they started doing when, when they, because uh, of course, like it's, it's, a, it's a universe and the same as they did with The Witcher, you have so many storylines, so how do you bring them together on the screen? So here they looked at the future books or the, the later books to see, okay, so apparently this character in this book turns out to be like half, um, like more Asian, Asian kind of, right? So let's bring that into the first, like let's give them the background from the very beginning and sort of make it work with this character. So I love that we also have these really good examples of how, I love that she says, um, and this is when I want to go back now, I want to link to Lord of the Rings, that she says, no, I grew up with these very traditional kind of fantasy, which are very white, very straight. So this is, of course, if this is like, you read what you, if you read what you read, it's very common that you reproduce that kind of story and that only later on you write stories that are different. And she said, as I wrote, as I gained more confidence, I started to write a world that looked a lot more like the world around me. That's what the author of uh, Shadow and Bone, uh, of the Grisha verse has said. Yes. So I so, thought that was a really good example. I agree. So I want to I want to bring in some more practical and like let's apply this kind of concepts. Yes. And I'm going to do this actually through Lord of the Rings. Great. I adore Lord of the Rings. Um I'm one of those writers that actually kind of believe the movies are better than the books for today's audience. Because the books for the the movies for me feel very immediate and they have some of that that punch and the storyline is very modern and the I, books don't really feel immediate all the time no they don't no, it know. feels very different medium believe me I've read them multiple multiple times they're sitting right next to me on my bookshelf but it's also I think the era in which it was written yes so we can honor that we can respect that we can even love it and this is one of the reasons why I, the more I work with this subject of uh, honoring where source material came from, the more I struggle with this idea of saying, oh, that's, that's, that's white people's stuff, or I'm a white person, so I like X. I'm, Lord of the Rings and other stories like it have made me very much sit down and be like, no, this is a, an, an, English story that comes from source material from Northern Europe. This is very much like a the the Nordic mythology influencing yeah. someone with an English viewpoint, and this is a cultural artifact that is extremely extremely white, and the characters in it look white. This is a story. <laughs> But it's not a white story. It is a Nordic English story. Yeah. And if yeah. we can honor that for being of those cultures, of that lineage, then you don't put the weight on it to be something other than what it is. Does that yeah. make sense to you? I, I get that. Yeah. But then you realize it's it's this, it, it is a Nordic English story told at this time and then filmed at this time. And if we told it all over again today from say a female American, we might change it up. We might reinvent the mythology as we do over and over again through human history. We tell the story again and we tell it a little bit differently and we reimagine it from a little bit different perspective. So part of what I'm thinking about is it's okay to say this story is inspired by this region and this mythology and this background and then decide if we wanted to let it just be that because there are there are mythologies and stories and concepts like Star Trek for me isn't a very American mythology kind of thing it has these like these concepts of like the UN or something bigger than the UN, the Federation, and 
it's uh, the humans are still kind of the leaders and we're all gonna come together, but we're gonna come together under the auspices of this leadership. It's not that everyone came together equally, it's that everyone came together and agreed with us. <laughs> And to me, that's a, you know, Very rather familiar. hegemony American kind of concept. And I won't get too political around that because frankly, I don't want to, and it take hours to even define a side or an opinion on the matter. But that to me is something that we could define as an American mythology. Yeah. Versus a, a mythology that would come from a different culture, a different time period. And that's actually something I struggled with. I'm like, well, what is American culture? What are American stories? And when I was working with that versus saying that Lord of the Rings is a very uh, English Nordic mythology and heritage, what I could come up with if I'm trying to define like an American mythology and heritage, you know, you have some of the Westerns, the Louis, Louis L'Amour books and Star Trek or things that I would say were like American mythologies that we have to reach back to. So when we're writing, if we're getting brass tacks, if we're trying to be very practical, we can make those questions of, do we want to tell the story this way? Or do we want to add to it? Do we want to reconsider that we're only pulling from this? Or sometimes like Disney chose to do with Frozen, do we just honor that we are telling a fairy tale from this part of the world and the princesses live in a very snowy white, Mm -hmm. uh, like frozen kind of icicle snow line and yes we dress this way and we we are you know white we're uh, I forget exactly which country frozen is set in yeah it's been a while since so and what you're just saying what makes really makes me um because these are choices right like so for example with Lord of the Rings when it was shot right um that was that was sort of like visual choices that were made, right? That were made, right? Even though I came across this is like the internet is such like I know I'm sure a lot of people figure that out already, but I am very disciplined in my internet use. So this was I, I entered such a rabbit hole when I was researching for this episode. So apparently at one point for the Hobbit, somebody got fired because oh, yeah, he had said, yeah. So he had said that hobbits need to look white like light skinned not white light skinned so they mm -hmm. didn't hire um a, a woman with uh pakistani roots i read that article yes yeah uh, so that a whole other discussion but so the, but these are choices right and like i love the how that article said at the end you know well peter jackson can sort of like you know wash his hands clear of this but he did just you know showed us three extremely white Lord of the Rings films. So it's no wonder that the person casting for The Hobbit, you know, kind of repeats that recipe, right? Because um, yeah. it's like, it's it's like almost explicit. Um, it's almost explicit. But so these, we see choices here, right? So when they shot Lord of the Rings, they decided, okay, so this is clearly set in this, even though it's a fantasy world, it's clearly kind of set right, in, in this sort of, like, this particular mythology. And then we have The Witcher, um, in which, yes, we see the same kind of, okay, so it's very Slavic, right, very Eastern European mythology folklore, um, even if it was written like that, right, and even if the characters were mostly white in the books, um, that doesn't mean we cannot shake things up, because if we create a fantasy world, right? Everything, you've already said it this episode, everything we ever do is based on something. Yeah. There is hot, like originality is not a thing. I think the way we combine things, that's where we, that's where originality comes from. So yes, you can use particular, for me, you can use particular mythology, but that does not mean that only white characters can work with that or fall under that umbrella. You can still, because we have this sense, you now when we envision the earth, right, our global, like, mother, mother earth, we kind of have, okay, so white people 
originate here. This is sort of the mythology that we have, right? White people come from here. You have the Native Americans come from here. Then you have Black people come from here. And then you have Asians and they come from there, right? But if you create a fantasy world. It doesn't have to work like that. Yes. And I think we forget that we don't like you can go all you can go all out. Yeah. Right. You can. Yeah. In my Mustang Rabbit um, Adelaide universe. Uh, most people are not white. I'm not extremely explicit about it because I'm definitely describing people in, in shades, kind of like we talked about in episode one of this season, where I'm not saying people are black or brown or white. Everyone is kind of a little bit more in the middle. And that was done intentionally, because even though part of a book one is set in something that would look a little bit, maybe like a medieval region of Europe, it doesn't necessarily mean there's people from all different uh, tribes and coming in and out of the sea and they've definitely mixed and Adelaide herself, as she defines herself in the beginning, she kind of has like this curly tighter hair and her skin is definitely on the spectrum of like a, a lighter brown, like, like a, an umber a little bit and it's not just talked about because they don't have the racial concepts in this world and that was that was I was like I don't have to borrow that I'm writing this entirely yeah. new world and uh some of them might show up with blue skin at some point it's like a concept I've played it with one area because there's so much originality so when we are creating these fully new worlds if we're struggling to imagine a world that's different than ours, go farther back in history. Yes. Like, come on, you only have to go back to the Roman Empire when people with more brown skin were ruling Northern Africa and Rome and some of the slaves rowing the galleys for the Romans were white Germanic peoples. Yes. Like totally yes. flipped around from how like we might imagine it now. And people don't even realize how many absolute Black people were living in Italy only a thousand years ago, mm -hmm. or 1200. Yeah. My dates could be a little bit off. I'm not really, really up on more older Italian history. But you don't have to go that far back to start just jogging, like study history, study our own history for different time periods farther back than the last two or 300 years when, yes. you know, the, yeah. when English language and the, the colonial powers of Europe were pushing around. And you realize you have a lot more concepts. You can change that palette. You can change that dichotomy that we've kind of split the world up into our heads and get a little bit more originality. <laughs> yeah. But it's also like when they say things like at that time, people of that color, like that's some of the comments that they, they had on, on The Witcher, they simply did not exist in, in middle, uh, in, in, in sort of like middle age Europe, in the middle ages in Europe. And I'm like, that is also not necessarily correct because people, I'm not saying they were masses, but people yeah. have traveled. One of my go-to ways of upsetting the apple cart when people start talking about that, and I'm like, well, did you know that there were white Christians fighting for Genghis Khan in Asia? I don't know <laughs> that, but it does not surprise me. Yeah, like people have always traveled, right? And that is, I think we, I, like what you said, like we, we're kind of stuck in the last few, a couple of hundred years, and it's like, it's, it's not... Like the first black people to come to the UK did not come there because of slavery. No. Right? There, there's people there who set up because there's like like ports everywhere. I mean, like like the UK is an is, is is one like it's it's one big island. So there's ports everywhere. And the first Africans did not come to North and South America because of slavery. They actually um, crossed the Atlantic on their own I believe it was the southern Atlantic on their own yeah but I think a lot of people nowadays even 
forget that um, African countries had like kingdoms, like wealthy kingdoms. And there's a reason why our museums have such amazing artwork from the African continent. That is because they had civilizations. And I the, think we, we, a lot of, I, I think a lot of people do not know that. The greatest library in the ancient world was set in Africa, in Alexandria. But that's my point. I think a lot of people are not aware even that they've had such rich civilizations and kingdoms before we came and... Yeah. So yeah, making this very practical too, because we could get on yes. our soapboxes about history. Making this very practical. Oh yes, I think we bring, just did. <laughs> bring in more history. Think about it. Like if you yeah. actually study the whole of human history, not just people who are very light skinned from Europe and their history and the last three hundred years, but if you spread that out, if you're writing sci fi in the future, if you're just writing sci fi, if you're writing fantasy worlds, extrapolate from so much more source material yeah and enjoy it and you can bring like if you're having troubles and you're like well you know the kernel of my idea is this very northern european mythology all right well are you going to write that northern european mythology and you want it to stay that way well then you can bring in your diversity in another way but if you want yes. to racially make it diverse then perhaps bring it in. But if you're bringing in other influences, such as historical concepts, etc. But if you're doing that, try to avoid repeating the negative tropes of history that don't honor every people group that you're trying to represent. Try yes. not to have another Denarius being held up in the air by a bunch of brown faces seen from Game of Thrones, because I absolutely know people stopped watching at that point and walked away. So this is also, if you're writing that book, which is going to be a film or a series, don't write away, like don't give away all your rights, right? <laughs> make sure you have a say. If you are writing it the right way, make sure they can take it from you. Yes, have, have a lawyer and go over your rights. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we are not lawyers. Get legal advice of your own. Yes, please. Yes. And then we do many the, things well, but that's not our thing. Yeah. And we are consciously today not getting into ideas of women or really getting to LGBTQ or any of that. Those yeah. are for different seasons. We're only talking about the racial diversity of these things. Yeah. Although it's a really good point that you said that you can like, and we've discussed this as well in the first, in, and during the first season, you can find diversity anywhere. It doesn't have to be about race and ethnicity. Yes. So if you are really yeah. telling a story where this is the people group you want to tell the story about, like, for example, Black Panther wanted to tell a story about Black people. And there's like two white people in that whole film. Oh God. And it, you know what I love the most? I had to think about Black Panther when... I was uh, I was reading about that savage stereotype mm -hmm. because when they go to that one tribe with the guys, the really tough looking big guys, uh -huh. who are like really grumpy. Uh -huh. I was initially I thought, no, 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 no. What are they doing? Because uh -huh. I thought they are perpetuating this massive stereotype. So I was losing my shit in the cinema. Right. I was like, this is Black Panther. What are they doing? And then they are the most hilarious guys. They're vegetarians. They're just, and I'm just like, so they took that stereotype. <laughs> they played with it. And then it was, it was such fun. So I'm like, they were badass vegetarians. I think some of them may have been vegans actually. <laughs> but that for me, it was like, I was really like, they're like, oh no, 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 you didn't. Like you did not perpetuate this stereotype. They didn't. But the, they no, but the way that they, they went about it, it was it was so well done. Um, so yeah, do feel free to fuck with some stereotypes uh, while yeah, you're at and, it. And if you're telling a story that is for one people group, even if it's set in a different world, just know that you're doing it. It's okay. It's like some of the best stuff that we've had come out. Like I just saw Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. 
and most of the people in that are Chinese or very Asian presenting, especially once they go to the other world. And that's fine because that yeah. is their source material. That's what they're doing. But sometimes when you're, when you're reinventing a whole nother world and you have the opportunity and you're building a world that has multiple people groups or building a world that has aliens, then you have this additional responsibility. Then you have a lot more to play with and you need to be aware of what you're doing. I haven't seen Dune yet, the newest one. I saw the old version of Dune and it, it was very much like Game of Thrones in the fact that you have the rich white uh, space-faring people, the family that comes in to Atreus Dune, the house Atreides, uh, very, very much white. And then the people out in the desert um, may or may not be. Uh, so that's, that's another, another one that just repeats the motif, so yeah. to speak. Um, I wanted to bring this up because I didn't have it in my original notes, but because you talked about if you make a book and it becomes a film, hold on to your rights for the <laughs> casting, the Hunger Games, um, as much as oh, I, I adored the of, film. Yeah. I have not read it and I've not seen the entire, like, but I've, I know the story a little bit. So tell yeah. me. Yeah. Katniss. Tell me. Katniss isn't necessarily this very white girl in the books. She's very much more of like a, because it's set in the future. She seems to be yeah. much more like a mixed heritage, but in the, in the movie, she's very, very much presented as a white person. So that's something that we see happening where you have a book that might be more open to pres uh, adaptation or open to people seeing more diversity and then when it hits the screen it becomes very much that cinematic let's make things very obvious one way or the other yeah but that's why i wanted to bring up like game of thrones versus the witcher and uh, shadow and bone yeah because there are different ways to go about these things and sometimes the author does it right or i mean right in quotation marks right uh and then it turns into this very stereotypical uh, problematic imagery and then sometimes the authors are aware that maybe they could have been more diverse and they even though they direct try to rectify that throughout the series so that would also be for me very practical like if you are already writing something right like let's say you are writing a series and you're like oh, i could have been more diverse like i would say the the advice from the author of the of the grisha verse if we take her what she did like it's not too late to layer in diversity, yeah. right? Like you can, characters who don't have a particular background yet, you can give them a certain background in the, in, in the films that follow, or in the films, <laughs> completely messed it up now, in the novels that follow. But also, of course, if in the first book or in the first couple of books, you have diverse characters, but they have only a minor role, and you are really, as you are listening to our episodes, you are really aware of that. <laughs> you can, you are the author. You can give them a bigger role. You can yes. give them a character arc. You can expand on them. Yes. Right? You are the maker. So I'm going to bring in some positive examples of people who are working towards just iterating and optimizing. I've mentioned her before, um, Tamora Pierce. She started her writing career with the, the Goddess Quartet, and it was a, a very white presenting uh, girl at the beginning. And for me, it was awesome reading this as a young woman because it's a girl who becomes a knight. She has to fake being her brother for a couple of years, but when she becomes a knight and then advisor to the king at the time, it's very much as a woman and everyone knows she's a woman and she changes her country. But racial diversity inside this completely different world, like they don't have the races that we have in this world, the author Tamora Pierce continued to build and expand and bring in more kinds of characters and people with different orientations and backgrounds. And not everyone was a noble anymore. She brought in like 
a street thief and other people and just built her world out and it became more and more yeah. diverse over her career. So yeah. Tamora Pierce is somebody I see who's doing a really good job or in, in continuing to satisfy her fans who love her main character she started with, but then bringing in other things as she goes. And then Jin Hale uh, wrote a two book series that I read. I haven't read the rest of her work, so I can't speak to it, but her Lord of the White Hell duology, we'll put the links in the show notes, is to me a really good example of keeping the uh, the white chosen one male trope and then completely turning it on its head. So she has, it's, uh, it's, it's a romance between two men that doesn't read much like a romance at first, but it, it's, it's a fantasy with a romantic element. I wouldn't say it's straight up romantic fantasy, but the, one of the characters is very much kind of like the, the curse. Uh, I would say it's based on a rough, uh, proto-French kind of background, kind of like the French noble court system at one point mm-hmm. in time. But it's it's definitely been morphed into this fantasy world that Jin Hale created of her own. And then there's this character that comes in and actually has the POV for most of the series is uh, Karam Kirzaki. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. He reminded me of some sort of amalgamation of uh, Jewish or Middle Eastern uh, background. He's definitely Mm -hmm. not as white as the other character. And he has a a matriarchal dominated uh, culture. And so these two cultures uh, meet at a school where they both end up going to school. So you have this, this uh, a noble who very much like the traditional white noble chosen one cursed kind of character that you come to expect in fantasy. And then this other much more of a alternative kind of hero and they meet and they both carry the story together and the way their stories mesh I found it to be um, not completely original, but really good use of two kinds of source material to create a story that is more relevant for audiences today. Yeah, well, I think that is. The, I think that is for me that is the important thing, right? Like we are writing today. Mm-hmm. And as an author, yeah. I would hope my book is still relevant enough to be read 30, 40 years from now. <laughs> yes, but also if it is adapted into some kick-ass film series 30, 40 years from now, like, wouldn't it be great if it reflected the population then? Yes. And I think yeah. we talked about this in the first season, but I'm going to repeat it, and I know you can repeat it mythology and story and the concepts that we as creators play with are so adaptable. We don't have to be stuck. No, we don't. And this, but this is why I wanted to bring up that point is that we have these ideas where people come from, right? Even, in, even if we create a world, but if you create a world, you can also create that bit. Yes. So like, yeah, stop limiting. So I have one more author that I would like to give a shout out to as someone who is being so creative. Okay, you get one more because we really need to wrap this up. I'm sorry. One long conversation. I'm so sorry. Bring it on. MCA Hogarth. I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, H-O-G-A-R-T-H. She writes the Dream Healer series. It's set in this universe. She, they, I'm not exactly sure of their pronouns, writes this dream healer series within their greater uh, space fantasy universe. Think Star Wars kind of like size, but without some of the like the Imperial Empire. And they, there's humans, there's elves, there's, well, space elves-ish. 
Um, and there's all of these genetically created um, other creatures that are sentient and part of an integrated society. And I'll keep it short, but she, they do such a good job taking care of their fans. They have such a huge universe and they turn so many things on their heads and make it so relevant. And they don't get stuck in some of these dichotomies that we were talking about, some of our stories today are stuck in. So I would just say, if you're looking for better, if you're trying to open your mind up as a creator, go read some of their work. That sounds like a really good idea. All right, I should stop rambling. Is there anything that you wanted to wrap up with? I'm apologizing, I got really excited today. No, but I think this is a really, this is a really exciting, because we both write fantasy. Um, so so I, I'd really love that we also talked about the freedom you'd like, like you also said, like when you talk about BBC Merlin, like, you know, you, you, you are allowed to change up a historical tale, mm -hmm. right? You are allowed to bring diversity, no matter what diversity means, right? Like you can have a Gwen who's played by, by uh, um, a black woman. Um, or who, is beco who becomes a black character um, but you could also have characters who are like suddenly in LGBTQI a plus relationships like it's it's we are the writers so we yeah. have the freedom to do whatever we want with whatever world we create or whatever world we want to recreate or rebuild as long as you know we are very sensitive yeah. to what we are creating and who we are creating within that world. And I think despite what Twitter trolls, et cetera, may yell about, there is an economic reason to lean towards diversity at this point in time. Don't think that you're going to be run out of the bookstores just because you do this. No, because like, like, like with The Witcher, what I saw is that like let, let's say 99% of the people is excited, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, the thing is, of course, things are changing and that makes certain people very loud. Yes. Yes, and I think we're seeing that, but I think because they're so loud, like I'm glad you bring this up, because they're so loud, we might think, well, if I do that, right? If you, if you have read read some of these these comments and you're like oh but I was going to take this particular mythology or I was going to base it like my, my it's a, it's a fictional world but it is based on like the sort of like Europe as, as is Europe right yeah right? um I mean it's your clay yeah so you can do whatever you want and like you said it's 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 very economically viable. Look to at do Bridgerton. Like, come oh, on. Yes. Bridgerton yes. is doing just fine. It's doing really fine. <laughs> it's doing better than fine. And it and I still oh I did not look into that. I still I still don't know if it was that racially diverse in the books. I don't think it was, but I don't want to go on record saying that. But I will say yeah. Hamilton. The, the stage play Hamilton brought in so much more diversity than I had ever seen associated with that period of American history. And that did extremely well. It did extremely well. Yeah. Yeah. So don't yeah. think that you're not going to be able to sell your work just because you don't stick to the really, really well-run tracks of like everything looking like it's Lord of the Rings. Not to be mad at Lord of the Rings, like I said, I love it. No. But you don't have to keep... That story has been told. Tell your own. Absolutely. And it's been told really well, and now it's our time. And our and turn. That's our time. So let's tell our own stories. Yes. All right. On this, I'm going to talk to you next week. All right. Happy writing, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. Music for this show was written and produced by Eric Mills. If you found this episode helpful, please rate and review on your favorite podcast app 
and spread the word so other writers can find us too. To get our Doing Diversity in Writing Toolkit, which includes all bonus material from Season 1, go to representationmatters.art. That's dot A-R-T. Here you will also find our episode show notes. Happy writing and see you next episode.